A Tale from the Spinosaurus Universe, Diamond's Story. It is recommended that you listen to the other two videos from this setting before this one to get a better grasp on the story itself. You can find those videos on my channel. James never had model parents, like so many other children. His were deadbeats and he'd been an accident created during a night of drug-induced, passionate frenzy. His parents had never viewed him as anything other than that. Which is why, in the summer after the world ended, after the dinosaurs decided to go full zombie apocalypse and come back from the dead, they upped roots and left him behind to die. The ten-year-old had been forced to watch from the boat dock in what had once been a campground, as his parents took their pontoon boat and sailed to the other side of the lake, leaving him. And he couldn't just hike around the lake to find them, because Lake Monroe, located in the southern half of Indiana, was too big for a young kid to hike around alone, having nearly 11,000 acres of open water, and with dinosaurs running around, the hike would be impossible to complete. Even before the apocalypse, hiking around Lake Monroe would have been close to undoable, Whatever chance there had been, though, had been permanently squashed. James returned to the boat dock every day, hoping his mom and dad would be back for him. He didn't miss them, but he also didn't want to become lunch for some hungry dinosaur, or become the victim to some angry herbivorous creature that saw him as a threat. He'd take his parents' company over the alternative. So, he sat on the boat dock, where hopefully most predators couldn't get to him, day after day. The dock was made of concrete, metal, and a few other materials, and was located within the old state recreation area, right by the beach, camp store, and main campground at Payne Town. It looked haphazard, and sounded as such when you walked on it, but it was solid and stable. A handful of boats, some half sunk, most either houseboats or speedboats, were still tied to it, their owners likely never to return. James slept inside one of the larger houseboats that was still afloat, after venturing aboard and finding that the bed inside was extremely comfortable. If James had known how to drive a boat, he would have followed his parents to the other side of the lake, which certainly wasn't any safer, but at least he wouldn't have been alone and tried to be useful to them just to survive. Taking their abuses would certainly have been better than what some hungry carnivore would do to him, at least in his mind. He never thought that he'd actually want to go back to them. He would bet that kids who had literally been raised by wolves had parents with more humanity than he did. But for once, James wished that he was still with them instead of waiting for some bad end to find him. He knew that was likely what would happen, likely by the teeth of a predator, despite his waiting and hoping for something better. Deep down, he knew it was only a matter of time. As his daily routine had carried on, he saw many examples of prehistoric life. In any other situation, it would have made kids lose their mind with excitement. But James just now found them scary. Many of them were the type of carnivore that would likely eventually catch him. He saw a Tyrannosaurus rex just walking around once, uninterested in him. And another time, he saw a Dimetrodon sunning itself on the boat ramp. The wildlife seemed abundant and diverse in the region. It was rare to see in the same species two days in a row, with many animals adapting well to the offered habitat. Another time, James watched a pack of pyroraptors scavenging along the edge of the water at one of the beaches. Despite their name's implications, they were more fish thieves than fire thieves. Once, there had been a herd of triceratops that came down to the water's edge for a drink. Not carnivorous, but possibly just as dangerous in their own way, and just as likely to end him as a tyrannosaur might be. There was also a single Compsognathus that had nested in an old payphone stand near the main boat dock that hadn't had a phone in it for decades, the only individual James saw regularly. It was the only local dinosaur that didn't pose a threat to James. It just squawked at him almost daily. However, on the day he was eventually caught, James hadn't seen anything that would have hinted extinct species again roam the planet. 
The area had been devoid of animals all morning, so he sat at the end of the boat dock again, not letting his feet dangle in the water in case some large prehistoric fish or other aquatic predator was around, and took in the unexpected serene morning. He found that it was a shame not being able to even dangle his feet in the water. Before the apocalypse, swimming in Lake Monroe had been his favorite way to pass the day. And exploring. That was something he greatly enjoyed. Once he'd followed a large rusty pipe that came out of the water and snaked off into the woods. But it didn't go anywhere exciting, but to a young kid it felt like a great adventure and a wonderful mystery. And while on that adventure, he'd found a rock on the beach that looked vaguely like the shape of the state of Texas. A worthless find, but to a kid it was exciting and a great memory maker. Since the park was close enough to his parents' house, he was able to often find his way there to escape them for the day and actually enjoy himself. The tranquil morning was cool and clear, but if the summer weather so far had been an indicator, it would soon become hot and humid. James was absent-mindedly staring as far across the lake as he could when he heard claws tapping on the dock as something walked up behind him. He realized he'd forgotten to check the shore behind him for threats for an extended amount of time. If he ever saw any, he would go inside the shack on the dock where the records of who owned what boat were kept and where the owners could check in and be ferried out to their boats. As that dawned on him, James felt two hands, with four claw-adorned digits, seize him, lift him up off the ground. It turned James to face towards itself, pale. It was a velociraptor, massively oversized, but the shape was unmistakable. It snarled and looked its catch over. The snarls then slowly seemed to turn to satisfying chunk. The thing truly was way larger than any velociraptor had a right to be, more like the size of a Utah raptor, which meant it had to be one of the rare talking things James had heard rumors of before the collapse. Talking ones were supposedly always larger than the non-talking counterparts, smarter too, and they always looked somewhat different too. The talking Spinosaurus had no eel-like tail, for example, and apparently, Tiny feathered velociraptors were given a massive upgrade in size to be on par with the bigger dromaeosaur species. In addition, beyond simply being massively oversized, this velociraptor had no feathers at all, another major difference between it and the non talking raptor of the species. James had heard that feathered talking dinosaurs did exist, but they seemed to be even rarer than the already rare talking ones. Who knew what the explanation for that was? It just made the event which brought the dinosaurs back even stranger. The talking ones supposedly could be reasoned with. They were perhaps as smart as humans, but also still dinosaurs. And as such, the carnivores saw nothing wrong with turning something as smarter than into prey if they were caught. Those instincts were not pushed aside, but still very much a part of them. That was just how life worked its cycle. Because of that, they were easily more dangerous than other dinosaurs, even other carnivorous ones. The raptor tightened its grip on James's arms and began to carry him off the dock, away from the shore, obviously not in the mood to be reasoned with. As the velociraptor carried its prize, it began letting out chittering, squawking barks that echoed across the lake turning its head with bird-like jerks, no doubt alerting its packmates that lunch was about to be served. The dinosaur was holding James in a way that both restrained him and didn't slow its quick strides, with James's legs dangling so they brushed along the ground, and so that his upper half was tucked against its belly. James certainly wasn't comfortable with that, given the fact that torn up bite-sized bits of his body would certainly soon be stewing away inside that very spot. Each time the boy struggled, the raptor tightened its grip and its claws pressed harder against James' skin. The boy still tried to squirm free. The raptor came to a swampy bay where no boats were anchored, and then snuck up through the trees. James eventually gave his struggling up, clearly unable to escape the dinosaur. 
Even if he got loose, he knew he wouldn't get far. So he just let it carry him to wherever, in resignation of the inevitable. When the dinosaur finally arrived at one of the old campsites, it dropped him. And James just curled up on the ground, like he would do when his parents were angry with him. His eyes squeezed shut as he heard more footsteps closing in on all sides. Good find, a voice said once the footsteps drew near. This one's awful small, said another, chattering deeply. And James felt warm breath on his face and a snout nudged his hand aside, and then a tongue slid across the side of his head. Ooh, this human is tasty, though, he added. James whimpered and curled into a tighter, protective ball as the pack of raptors began discussing how they should eat him. Though his predatory instincts truly were still present in the talking ones, it seemed, as they had no qualms about what they planned to do next. I want one of the legs, said another new voice, a male one that was completely matter-of-fact as it spoke. The muscles are always tender there, it added. James had never felt more terrified in his life, and the only thing he could do was wait for one of them to take the first bite and hope that they'd be decent enough to kill him outright instead of eating him while he was still alive as he'd heard other non-talking dromaeosaurs tended to do. Listening them to bait on how they were going to eat him was the worst thing he'd ever been forced to endure, easily topping the abuses he'd taken from his parents over the years of what would end up being his short life. He's just a child, a new voice then said. Unexpected, quiet, without confidence, among the voices of its eager peers sounded feminine, and it was the first non-male voice James had heard. His tone was one of protest and not eager anticipation like the others. So what? He's easy prey, the second voice James had heard said dismissively, sounding like it was bored of waiting for its packmates to decide what parts they wanted. But he's just a boy, a child, the female voice said again. I. I don't want to hurt him. Enough, said a new voice, another female. As the Alpha, I will say what we do with him. Her voice had a tone that demanded respect, likely why she was the Alpha of the pack. Even from the short statement, James could hear the authority she held among the other raptors. The other raptors quieted down as their Alpha strolled into their midst having hung back to watch the situation play out. James heard her footsteps approaching him steadily, with purpose in their stride. They stopped next to him, and a clawed foot pushed him onto his back, out of his protective ball, then stepped down on his chest. He still didn't open his eyes, even as he felt its killing sickle claw prick him right over his heart. He even squeezed his eyes shut tighter not wanting to even see a glimpse of the dinosaurs that surrounded him. If I stabbed him here, he'd be dead in a minute, the Alpha said, possibly inviting comment from the raptor who had rebuked the opinion of the rest. It wouldn't be the first human. Red, please, said the only other female James had heard. Tell me, Diamond, why do you think we shouldn't eat this human here? You've never protested before. For any creature, Red asked. If I struck him with my claw now, it would be quick. Just like the others, he wouldn't suffer for more than a few seconds. He was caught by our fellow here fairly. You know as well as the rest of us that is simply the way the cycle of the world works. Diamond didn't answer for a moment, then said, I don't know. My instincts outside of the ones my carnivorous side are saying, maybe? I just feel like we shouldn't. Maybe because he's just a youngster. Maybe it's... Maybe it's the part of me still in grief speaking up. Part of me that wanted to be a mother, but didn't get to. The part who had to watch her future children. Diamond trailed off. Then her voice returned with an increase in confidence. 
I don't like the idea of any more children not getting to live their lives like mine. And he's young. That means he has a mother somewhere. But I can't put her through the pain I felt. No one with a child should ever feel that loss. Even if he was caught as prey fairly this time, I have to protest. Red stared at the other after now with a softened gaze. She understood the tragedy her packmate was referring to. It had been a time that had really affected Diamond, losing her first and only ever clutch of eggs, and it had left some mental trauma, even though she'd mostly recovered with the support of her pack behind her with companionship. But that void left by the trauma had never refilled completely, and this event had clearly drudged some of those memories back up from that void. Red sighed and took her foot off James. Okay, she said, concern and understanding as she spoke, not looking at James, but at her packmate. I'll spare him, but his fate is now your responsibility and yours alone. Whatever happens to him, if he runs away or is caught by something else, it is on you and not the pack. Understand? I understand. Diamond nodded. Thank you, she said. Red nodded, giving Diamond a slight smile. James, meanwhile, had now dared to crack his eyes open ever so slightly. He saw five oversized, featherless velociraptors standing around him. Diamond was covered in bluish-green scales everywhere, except for her belly and the inner sides of her legs and the underside of her tail, which were all light gray in color. Most of her body also had an ever-so-slight purplish tinge to it as well, but it was never the dominant color at any point. The rest of the pack dispersed, one particular individual grumbling and harshly until Red silenced them with a warning hiss. But Diamond remained and slowly approached James once they were gone. James was still shaking and clearly terrified, even as he opened his eyes fully to gaze at the raptor that had saved him from being ripped to pieces and eaten by the other members of its pack. Thank you, he managed to quietly say, voice trembling ever so slightly. Diamond smiled at him, slowing herself down and crawling up next to him on all fours, in an effort to be more at eye level and appear less thre threatening. She hoped it came off as such, but she wasn't sure nor was she sure how to truly approach the situation she was now in by her own volition. After examining James for a moment, she jumped back onto her hind legs and picked him up like the other raptor had done, but she did so in a much gentler manner and didn't forcefully tuck him against herself. Rather, she held James against her chest, purring softly, and he couldn't help but lean against her in response to her clear attempt to calm him down after his terrifying experience. He found himself surprised at how quickly he went from being terrified of the dinosaurs to now leaning into one for comfort. Like a switch was flipped. Where's your family? Diamond asked. If he knew, then she'd take him back there. After all, she wouldn't want another mother to experience what she had before. Taking their son back would help keep that from happening. I don't have one, James quietly replied. Diamond continued purring, suddenly sounding pleased. No, the sound was rather more suddenly hopeful, even daring excitement about something. However, the sudden change in tone vanished as quickly as it appeared, as Diamond internally talked herself down and told herself not to get ahead of herself. At best, this would only be a temporary charge in her care. Well, you do now. At least until we find people for you. The others will come around, I promise, she assured. Feeling excited at James's response despite telling herself not to. Maybe there would be no people for him to go to. Uh, could she finally fill that void? After a second, she steadied herself again thinking that she was making too many promises and entertaining too many hopes too quickly. 
There was a hundred things that might keep this child from staying. She had to remind herself about that, despite her eagerness. Come on, she gently said, with part of her still hoping that she might have another chance at being a mother. If her human charge was okay with the idea, and there was indeed nothing that took him from their territory. That was by far the most likely probability in her eyes. So she was braced for it just in case it did come to pass. Still carrying him in a gentle manner, she took James back to her nest, which was in one of the other nearby campsites. The campsite itself was small, primitive, with just within view of the lake. And the nest within wasn't far from an old fire ring that sat in the campsite. Diamond set James down inside the nest before laying down next to him in a protective manner, instinctively snuggling close to him in a shielding way, like a mother bird would do with her freshly hatched chicks. Her nest wasn't large. It was basically a small hole dug into the ground with some leaves and sticks forming an outer raised border. So she had to lay close along his side and snuggle around his form. But James didn't really mind being basically trapped in the spot. He found that he trusted the raptor after what she had done and how she had treated him. Diamond gently stroked his hair with one of the claws growing from her fingers, trying to make him feel comfortable. James couldn't deny to himself that he thought it felt nice. It was a feeling that he had never experienced, and he realized that Diamond, the dinosaur, had already shown him more care than his mom or dad ever had. And that was just in the span of a few minutes, too. What did that truly say about the kind of people his mom and dad were? Diamond, meanwhile, just hoped she wasn't being overbearing at all, even though she wanted to fill the void she had inside. She didn't want him to feel like it was too much sudden affection. She wanted nothing more in her life than to have a chance to be what was taken from her the moment her eggs had been crushed, even though part of her kept saying it wouldn't happen here. She was a soul as lonely as her sudden charge was. But if there was someone of his own kind the boy could go to, then she knew she'd have to take him there despite her own feelings. He said he didn't have one, but what if there was a chance that that might have been the case? That came to pass. That indeed he did have people he could go to. And so be it. However, for the moment, Diamond could enjoy having at least a feeling of what being a parent to something was like. The worry of being overbearing came hurtling back, though. Her private concerns of showing too much affection were alleviated, though, when James gently began to stroke Diamond on the top of her head. She purred softly, a shittering sound emerging from deep in her throat, and her whole body relaxed. James sat up and began to hug her not wanting to let the one thing that had not only saved his life, but ever seemed to care for him go. Diamond continued to chitter softly and just let him hug her for as long as he wanted, wanting to give her unexpected charge all the love she could now that she had something to care for. Maybe the moment would not be fleeting after all. The weeks went on, and summer was slowly passing. By the signs, it had turned to late July. Diamond had long since showed James the now-abandoned camp store, which he had never thought to look inside of before. The door had been left unlocked, and when checking inside, James found that there was not only camping supplies inside, but plenty of food to last for months, though the ice cream was all long melted. The shelves were still stocked with canned, dried, or bagged food, large packages of bottled water, simple first aid kits, and basic survival gear. It seemed that no looters had ever thought to raid a tiny camp store. There were also fishing rods, equipment to clean fish with, bait items, chopped firewood, lighters, informative pamphlets on wildlife and plant species, cheap odds and ends that might have use at some point, and even a tent and sleeping bag were still in the store. In addition, there were also bottled sodas still in the cooler, a whole lot of them. Their discovery had been a pleasant surprise, and while they were warm, they made a tasty treat nonetheless. Diamond didn't find the carbonated drinks to be anything special when she tried one. 
but she found the stuff in the store to be interesting and took her time peering at the rows of shelves, her claws ticking on the concrete floor as she walked down each aisle. James knew that the winter was going to be hard, so getting an early start on preparing was key. The houseboat he'd spent weeks sleeping in had no power, and he wasn't sure how to change that. But he had experience at keeping warm during the winter without heat. His parents' house rarely ever had heat during the cold months. They were always more focused on cooking methamphetamines and being high on it than having heat in the house. They spent their drug money on all sorts of things other than a furnace to warm the decaying shack they called the house, which was hardly even insulated. So James had spent his childhood learning how to survive the winter. James also knew that the dozens of other still-anchored houseboats on the lake likely had supplies on them as well, some of which would be very useful for keeping warm, such as sweatshirts and blankets. Nothing else. He could at the least make a giant bundle of them for himself. In addition, he had also been properly introduced to the pack, but this time as one of them and not as their next meal. The individuals other than Diamond were Red, the alpha of the pack, Ghost, Path, and True Eyes. Ghost was paler white in color, with gray stripes and silver speckles on the back of his head, as well as wild-looking white claws on his hands and feet. He had been the one who caught James, and he had apologized for wanting to eat him several times. Ghost was an eager individual, who loved the thrill of hunting and chasing down prey, be that prey a small fish or something much larger with legs that could run. He'd once, living up to his name in the process, showed James just how easily he could disappear in a forest environment. It was so quick that it was frightening. Path was more of a solid dark gray color, with some blue splotches, a softer individual in terms of personality, but still a relentless hunter. Red was mostly gray, except for the red-orange dorsal coloring on her back, which folded over the top of her head like a hood almost. Red was a smart leader, and fiercely defended her pack when needed, caring deeply about each individual. In True Eyes was about as dull in personality as his own gray coloring was. He was the only one in the pack to not apologize to James for what they had been about to do to him. He looked like he still wanted to snack on the newest pack mate, but he wouldn't risk actually trying it. When she'd apologized to him, Path had also explained to James that one reason for their initial coldness towards him, in contrast to the friendliness he now enjoyed, was the fact that in the moment he'd been viewed as they viewed any other potential creature they caught, as prey, and thus they'd been impartial towards his feelings on what would happen. It did take time, but James came to accept this and soon came to trust them, except for True Eyes. James wisely kept his distance from him. Ghost and Path also began to take turns watching James so Diamond could find herself something to eat. They both had come to like him greatly, almost seeing him as a little brother. Red also liked him well enough, but didn't take a turn at watching him. Being the alpha of the pack, she didn't do jobs like that. Diamond, meanwhile, proved herself to be a very loving character. Despite her dangerous claws and teeth, she was far gentler and more kind to James than his own mother had ever been. Diamond clearly was enjoying her motherly role as well with a sparkle steadily growing in her eyes and confidence slowly replacing the fragile state she'd met James in. Going above and beyond for anything her unofficially adopted child needed. And as the weeks and months went on, the idea of something coming and taking James away became an ever more distant thought in her mind. With that, the void within her was also all but filled again. James had gotten the privilege of watching the pack hunt on several times. He found them when he wasn't the target of the hunt. Seeing them work and sneak up on prey that had no clue the raptors were around was exhilarating. The campground they had set up their territory in was large and open, with few trees in the area around the camp store, the beach, and boat docks. It was a good area and attracted many animals. One day, 
a lone sub-adult, Stepe Mammoth, had wandered out from the forest area of the campground, and the oversized velociraptors took notice. From the camp store, James had got to watch the five dinosaurs creep close, slowly, on all sides, as the unaware mammoth strolled through the campground, heading towards the lake when suddenly Diamond and Red had leapt in from either side and latched onto the mammoth's side, tearing into its leg muscles. It bellowed and stamped, but couldn't shake the raptors off as two more, ghost and true eyes, leapt up from in front of it as it was mid-stamp and latched onto its neck. The mammoth continued shaking its head as Path joined the chaos by leaping onto the mammoth's head. After a few further minutes of vicious slashing claws, the mammoth collapsed and the raptors finished it off. All six members of the pack ate very well that night. Once cooked, James thought the meat tasted somewhat like tough, tender wood bison, a meat he knew well because his parents tended to enjoy buying what they saw as exotic meat with their dealing money. Whenever the raptors made a kill, James cooked the share he was provided, anything from white-tailed deer meat to fresh fish caught in the lake, in the various firings scattered throughout the entire campground, which had quickly begun to feel like a home to the boy. He'd never thought in the wildest fantasy the apocalypse would have, get, would have been the thing that saved him from the pitiful life he'd once had with his parents. Instead of a tiny shack that was falling apart, he now had an entire campground to explore and call home. One cloudy morning, James had awoken before Diamond. He was lying on his back facing the sky, and she was snuggled up next to him, holding him with loving gentleness like she always did. James understood why Diamond liked keeping him so close. He'd been told how she'd lost her clutch of eggs, of the near debilitating trauma that followed, and he knew that she didn't want to risk it happening again. It might have been young, but James was old enough to know that there was still lingering trauma there that manifested in Diamond's constant protective hold on him so he didn't mind it one bit. After all, she'd saved him and was giving him a chance to actually have a happy life, so however she went about doing it was okay with him. Since he still slept in her nest alongside her, he knew he couldn't move without waking her, so James stayed still and waited for his guardian to awake herself. Her hand rested on his chest, and he could feel the claws at the ends of her fingers resting against his skin, lightly pricking at him through his shirt. His curiosity towards them suddenly peaked. Though he had lived with the raptors for months by then, he'd never actually taken a proper look at their claws, one of the most standout features of the dinosaurs. Their claws, the very thing that had made Velociraptor and the members of its collective genus famous, were the one thing that he had never properly looked at. He could feel the largest claw on one of Diamond's toes laying across his leg and looked down on it. They really were wicked looking. Diamond's claws were all dark gray in color, and they looked like they'd really pack a punch. They looked like they definitely lived up to the reputation they'd been given in nearly every piece of dinosaur media. Impressive, aren't they? Diamond asked. James hadn't noticed she'd woken up, and he realized he must have disturbed her when he sat up to look at the claw that was against his leg. Morning. She added with a yawn, shaking her head and smacking her jaws lightly. Her tone sounded somewhat amused when she spoke. Did I wake you up? James asked. Sorry if I did. No, you didn't, Diamond replied. I've only been lightly dozing since the sun came up. If you want to look at them, you can. It's natural to be curious, and it's not like they're a secret. James nodded after a moment, finding himself truly very curious for a look. He took her hand and ran his thumb over the claws. I noticed that in the movies I used to watch secretly in the middle of the night, that they'd always focus on those ones when a raptor showed up, he said, when his gaze drifted down to the large sickles on each middle toe. But actually seeing them, they're really cool. I used to have a Velociraptor plushie toy. I always liked the big ones on the inner toes. They looked like they could protect, well, me. Only my plushie had been the real thing. He stopped talking for several seconds. 
until he realized that he was staring and he shook himself. Sorry, I didn't mean to stare, he murmured. Diamond was right. He couldn't help being curious. Getting to see the deadly parts of a killer dinosaur up close without risk was a rare opportunity, but touching them really did make him feel small, and it had drug up some hard memories as well. He was even more grateful now that he was getting a good look of, at them, that they had not been used on him. Diamond chuckled. I don't think the deer I sunk them into yesterday would agree that they're so cool, she said. Standing up and stretching. Are you hungry? She asked, wanting to get off the topic of her precious human's painful past. Yeah, I could eat, James replied, looking grateful that Diamond hadn't pressed the issue. I just need to build a fire first, he added, hoping the embers from the one the night before would still be warm enough to make the job easy. Diamond nodded. I can catch you something while you do that. What would you like? Fish? Turtle? Squirrel? Duck? Diamond asked naming off a mix of things she enjoyed. Before James could answer, he felt something land on his head. A drop of water. He looked up and felt one land in his eye. Aw, oh, man, he groaned. A raincoat had been one of the things the camp store didn't seem to have. He'd yet to find one, and he was not overly fond of getting wet. Not to mention, now a fire to cook breakfast with definitely wasn't going to happen. Diamond looked up at the sky. Hmm, she chittered softly. She didn't mind the rain, but knew James did, and that he was a little bit less tolerant of the elements than she was. You might want to go inside. Where's that boat you said you were sleeping in? On the furthest dock from here, James replied, looking a little miserable at having to go all the way there. Diamond paused, then she chittered again. I have an idea. Come down with me to the dock where Ghost found you. It's much closer. After arriving, the rain still light, but becoming heavier, Diamond stopped at the edge of the dock and pointed out at a specific pontoon boat. It was about six feet away from the dock and was sunk at the bow end, but the stern was still completely above water, at more or less an even level due to the shallow water. It had a roof over the half that wasn't sunk. Will that work? Diamond asked. Yeah, James replied. Diamond nodded and crouched, motioning him to climb onto her back. James climbed up as instructed, and with a powerful leap, Diamond jumped over the water and onto the boat, which one could stand on easily due to its even level. She landed on both feet with a heavy thud that shook the body of the wrecked boat, and James jumped off getting under the roof with Diamond just behind as it began to rain harder. Thank you, James said, listening to the increasing patter of rain on the metal roof as they settled down behind the boat operator's seat to wait the rain shower out. Anything for you, Diamond replied, nuzzling her human child with warmth and tenderness. James smiled and hugged her tightly, causing Diamond to purr. You seem really happy, James said. Diamond smiled at him. Believe me, I am. I, I always wanted to be a mother, as you know, and it almost didn't happen either. Taking you in was a golden chance for me, even though at the time I thought it might have just been for that day only. I just hope you've been happy with us. James smiled and began gently rubbing Diamond's nose as she curled around him, keeping him warm as the temperature began to drop from the weather. I have been. You're the kind of parent I always wanted. One that actually loves me, James said, still stroking her head. More like the kinds of moms some of the other kids I knew had. Ones who cared for them. And you're not even human. <laughs> Diamond nudged him affectionately in the car. Hey, Diamond, James asked. Yes, she replied. I just want you to know that, well, beyond being what I wanted for a parent, you've been the best thing I've ever had in my entire life. Is it okay if I started calling 
calling you my mom? James replied, nervous about asking. He'd been hesitant to do so, much less ask sooner. Not because he considered his birth mother his mom, though. He'd only called his biological mother mom one time, and he'd gotten smacked for it. However, Diamond, dinosaur or not, had already shown James more love and care than that woman ever had. It was a true testament to which one was truly more human. When the resurrected animal with killing claws that just happened to have the rare anomaly of a powerful brain very similar to a human one showed more love and humanity than the actual human did. Nonetheless, he'd been so scared about how she might react, despite the role in his life that she'd taken up, that he just couldn't make himself be brave enough to say the word until then. But as he saw her reaction, James felt instant relief, and he knew that he had just made Diamond the happiest dinosaur on the planet. I'd love that, Diamond eagerly answered, and James smiled again. I love you, my sweet son, Diamond said, almost not daring to say the words that she'd felt would be forever denied to her, as James laid down and rested against her side. Diamond purred as he did, holding her treasure close with her claws and not letting go. They both got what they wanted in the end. James truly had a parent, and Diamond the Velociraptor finally had a child to care for. The void was filled. James was still hugging her when Diamond lifted her head and snatched something from the water. Grinning like a dinosaur could, she held a wriggling, small mouth bass out. Breakfast? she asked through clenched teeth. James laughed. <laughs> I'll wait until the rain's over. Raw fish doesn't sound too appetizing to me. Diamond nodded, and with a few snaps of her jaws, the fish had vanished down her gullet. Suit yourself, but I was getting hungry too. You can eat all the fish you want. There's a whole lake full, James said. Diamond actually giggled at the comment and lightly poked her son on the nose with one of her finger claws. With how much you eat, that might not be enough. Hey! James protested. But Diamond just laughed and nuzzled him again. She loved having a child more than anything else, and she showed that affection in that moment by giving James a giant loving lick right across his face. M Mom, James said, wiping the saliva off. He'd still been hesitant to say it for just a moment, but he shoved his fear aside, and the word had come out sounding natural. Diamond shrugged at his protest. Just showing you I love you in my own way, she said. And if you don't approve, you'd best hope I never have to give you a bath that way. <laughs> don't worry, I'll wash in the lake, James assured. Diamond just chuckled quietly, tapping her large toe claws on the shag carpeted deck of the boat in amusement. For the first time in her life, Diamond was truly happy. This narration is a side story, set apart from the events of the previous two narrations, which are within the same post-apocalyptic setting. If you'd like to check out those, then please feel free, they're on my channel. Like the others, this is also from my upcoming book, and within it, it is also kind of a side story. During the main plot, there are times where I drift away from it for a chapter to give you a wider sense of what's going on elsewhere in the world that's outside of the main character storyline. If you enjoyed this, then please stay tuned for a nar another narration from the same universe that will be coming out tomorrow, and I also hope to do one more on Wednesday if I can record it and have it edited. I kind of doubt it, so that will probably not come out till next week, but I'm going to try. But at the very least, you will definitely get one more tomorrow, so please stay tuned for that if you enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, this was just a little, a nice little lighthearted side story as I wanted to do like a Raised by Wolves sort of thing. And uh, it kind of just came to me and Lake Monroe itself is a place that I, I love. And so setting it there really just gave this one a personal feeling, which is why I wanted to narrate it. So once again, thank you for listening and please check out the other narrations I've done. And if you're interested in reading the actual story, then please check back in a few months whenever it's a Whenever it's released, the book is about halfway edited into its final state right now, 
little hiccup came up, and it's going to be a bit before editing can resume, but it should still come out this year. So yeah, thank you all one more time for listening, and I'll see you in the next video. One other thing that I forgot to mention and only realized after I started editing was that the illustrations you saw throughout this video were drawn by me, with the exception being the thumbnail picture, which was drawn by my friend Cobalt the Righteous. The Illustrations are all based on moments throughout the uh, series, the books, and I put them throughout this one, and I'll probably reuse them again in the future, just to tease certain events and moments and characters who you haven't met yet. So anyway, yeah, that's what those were all about and why they didn't, except for the one of Diamond, obviously, didn't really contribute to the overall narrative. So yeah, I just wanted to clear that up.